If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. Here we have the general equation that governs the motion of a general wave. And then in the question, we have a specific equation that governs the motion of this particular wave. And what we're going to do is line those two equations up with each other so we can begin to extract some useful information. Now, by aligning the equations, we can see that the angular frequency omega is this four radians per second right here. Now that's useful because in part A, we are asked to calculate the frequency. And there is a nice relationship between frequency and angular frequency. You probably have learned that two pi multiplied by the frequency is equal to the angular frequency. And so if we divide both sides of that equation by two pi, we would have the frequency equals the angular frequency divided by two pi. So we can plug in the value for the angular frequency, which was stated to be four inverse seconds here, and then divide that by two pi. And when you compute that, you would get about 0.64, and the standard unit of frequency is hertz. So this is the correct answer to part A of the question. In part B, we are asked to find the wavelength of the wave. So let's take a look at some formulas that will help us solve for the wavelength. In particular, we're going to be able to use the fact that the speed of the wave is equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency. And the reason that we can do that is because the question gives us the speed of the wave. Right here, it tells us the speed V is 40 centimeters per second. So let's take this equation where V is equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency, divide both sides by the frequency. So then we have the speed divided by the frequency is equal to the wavelength. And then we were given the speed and then we just calculated the frequency. So let's plug them in. So there the values are. When you compute that, you should get approximately 63. Dimensionally, we have centimeters per second divided by hertz, but hertz is one over seconds, so the seconds would cancel out. This gives us a wavelength in the unit of centimeters. So this is the correct answer to part B of the question. Let's go back up and see what part C is asking us to do. And it says in part C, that if the wave equation is of this given form, what are y sub m. So let's just pause right there, y sub m. Well, actually, we can look back at the equations that we had aligned earlier, and we can see that y sub m, which is sort of the coefficient of sine, in this case is equal to five centimeters, which is also the coefficient of sine. So there's really no need to calculate anything in part C. We can simply say by inspection that the y sub m, which is the amplitude of the wave, is going to equal five centimeters. So that's the correct answer to part C. In part D, we need k, the so-called angular wave number. Now that will be a relatively straightforward endeavor because the angular wave number is two pi divided by the wavelength. We just figured out the wavelength was that roughly 63 and that was in centimeters. And when you plug this in, you should get 0.1. The unit would be radians because the two pi is in radians divided by centimeters. So this is the correct answer to part D. Now on to part E, which asks us for the angular frequency omega, but we've already done that. Remember, by inspection, by lining up the equations, we saw that the angular frequency was that four radians per second. So very simply for part E, we could say that omega is equal to four radians per second. So that would be the correct answer to part E. In part F, they are asking us for the correct choice of sign in front of omega. Once again, simply by inspection, we can see that the equation has a negative sign in front of the omega. So the correct answer to part F would be a minus sign. And by the way, if there is a minus sign in that equation, that actually means the wave is traveling to the right. So it's sort of the opposite of what you might expect. So as a side note, the wave is traveling to the right because of that minus sign. Now we can cap this off with part G, which asks us to find the tension in the string. And for a speed, or excuse me, for a wave on a string, the speed of that wave is governed by this equation. We're looking for the tension, which is this tau value right here. So what we're going to do is square both sides of this equation. We get V squared is equal to tau over mu, and then multiply both sides of the equation by mu. So then you would get mu times the speed squared is equal to the tension tau. Now, as for mu, that was given in the problem. That is the so-called linear density. And the question tells us that the linear density density is four grams per centimeter. So with that value of mu, as well as the speed of the wave, we can plug in to find the tension tau. 
So the values have been plugged in, but in fact, before computing them, some of you might have noticed that these are not standard units. They're not going to give us a tension force or a tau value in newtons. So we probably want to actually pause for a second here and set up a little conversion. So we have four grams over one centimeter, but let's not forget that 100 centimeters is one meter. And then additionally, we need kilograms. So we know that one kilogram is 1000 grams. So setting things up in that fashion cancels the centimeters, it cancels the grams. Now we have the standard units of kilograms and meters. We're gonna to need to do something similar here. We have 40 centimeters over one second. And again, one meter is 100 centimeters. Don't forget to square this too. We have the centimeters canceling out. So now let's pick up our calculators and process that calculation. And when we do so, we would get a tension in the string of 0.064. Now it's in newtons because of our standard unit conversions. This is the final answer to part G.